Ask the Experts platform is a monthly segment that offers an opportunity for Namibian journalists to engage noted experts in one-on-one -on -one discussions on the COVID-19 pandemic. Journalists get to pose questions to experts in various sectors to ensure that they are equipped with the necessary information to better inform their readers, listeners, and viewers. COVID-19 is our common enemy. Together, we can defeat it. Proudly brought to you by the Namibia Media Trust and the DW Academy. Good morning and welcome, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Hashtag Ask the Experts. I am uh, your moderator today, Nina Katangana. Now today we will be talking about the COVID-19 antiviral um, pills. And joining us as our expert this morning is Dr. Ishmael uh, Kashitai. Um, we also of course have Salma Moses, our sign language interpreter joining us this morning as well. So good morning and welcome to everybody. For all the participants uh, that are joining us uh, for this session, please do know if you have any questions, you can put it in our chat box uh, or you can uh, raise your hand and we will give through the questions to Dr. Uh, Ismail. Now, pharmaceutical giants, uh, Merck and Co, as well as Pfizer, have recently developed uh, COVID-19 antiviral drugs called Malnupiravir and Paxlovid, respectively. And Dr. Ismail will um, give us all he knows this morning concerning these two antiviral drugs. Dr. Ismail, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us once again. Yes, good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this program, uh, for allowing me to share some information on these new drug developments. It's in fact correct that you actually say that these drugs were actually new discoveries. They've actually been, they, they have actually added some power in terms of dealing with our, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which we have actually having. So they're actually giving us an effective means of actually dealing with the problem which we've actually been uh, having. But please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Doctor, first up, tell us why would you know a drug such as these be important? Yeah, it's 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 very important. Uh, these these drugs are quite important because it's actually one of the few oral drugs which have actually received emergency approval for use against COVID infections. You know that for a long time we have been struggling to really find a oral drugs. You know about so many experiments which have actually been done. We've been looking at hydroxychloroquine. We've been looking at many other drugs which have also raised a lot of controversies. But this is actually the first drugs which have, the two of them have, are actually the first drugs which have actually received emergency use approval for, for being used as oral drugs against this corona infection. And that's a reason why they are quite important. But the main, main most important thing is actually that we, we can actually use these drugs by taking them even at home. If you start getting COVID uh, symptoms and the symptoms are mild and they are, they are moderate, you can actually start using them very early and they can actually prevent you from progressing into a severe situation where you will have to require hospitalization. So they're quite effective. They're coming with very good numbers during which they actually shot during the trial. And this is the reason why they effectively received emergency use approval. Mm -hmm. Doctor, I think um, a lot of people, when the drugs was first announced and we heard about it, and I mean, it was just recently, it was in December, I think early December, where, uh, you know, mainstream media was talking about these antiviral drugs. Um, and the understanding was that it would be used for COVID-19 treatment. So for uh, patients, specifically those who are more prone to, to uh, be seriously ill with uh, the COVID-19 virus would then be treated with this drug. You've just mentioned that it can also be taken as a preventative uh, measure um, to avoid getting really uh, ill with COVID-19. Yeah, yeah. The, the, main, the main thing is actually that, you know, there is, not, there is no replacement to vaccines. One, one needs to have a better understanding of these drugs. The main thing is it cannot be taken by everyone who has got covid we're looking at specific individuals. Those individuals will be, if I can just put it straightforward, for the drug pavox, pavoxylate, you will have to be 
uh, older than 12 years. Okay, that's one condition. Where as for the molnupiravir, you need to be older than 18 years and above to to be taking it. Uh, you need to be diagnosed with uh, with 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 COVID-19. It must be a laboratory proven. There must be a laboratory proven PCR test or even uh, antigen test, which will actually confirm that you've got COVID. And then the second thing is actually that you need to have symptoms, mild symptoms or moderate symptoms, which will actually show that you are actually sick from COVID. So th those are th those two symptoms actually the the main things. And then the third one is actually the third condition which needs to be fulfilled before you can actually be put on those drugs is actually that as you rightfully said, you must be having a risk factor at least one risk factor, which puts you at the risk of actually progressing in a severe condition which will actually result into hospitalization or even other other bad outcomes or whatever it is. So those three conditions must be first be met before you can actually be put on those drugs. So that is the difference to the, for instance, for the vaccines. Whereas with the vaccines, you are given those vaccines before you are you have even developed the disease. It's basically drugs which will which will obviously program and, and, and help you to prevent getting infected, whereas these drugs are actually used once you are actually infected. But it is not it is not for everyone, as you can actually see. You need to meet those three conditions before you can actually get them. Doctor, when you say uh, you need to have, uh, there's a risk factor involved, uh, does that mean that, you know, a potential patient, you know, would either have a comorbidity or an underlying health issue? Is that what you mean? Uh, and I wanted to know by risk factor, do you mean having a comorbidity or underlying a serious underlying health issue? Yes, yes, you, you, it's correct. I can just give you a run through those conditions which, are, which, which will put you at risk of actually progressing into a severe condition. These are, for instance, patients with HIV, especially if they are CD4 counts and, they are, and their immune condition is quite low. It's a patient who have actually been receiving certain medications which are known to decrease your immunity. This includes steroids. This includes certain uh, anti-cancer treatments which we give. But there's also some anti-inflammatory drugs which we use for rheumatoid arthritis, which can also decrease your immunity. Or in fact, even the conditions itself, such as rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory other conditions which can also put you at risk of actually developing that. There are certain conditions like Seychelle cell disease. There are certain con neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis or other conditions which will actually do, do uh, result into that. There are patients who have got kidney failure, liver failure. So even diabetics and even people with high blood pressure, we know that COVID can actually, actually put a big challenge on your body and these are actually the people who can actually qualify for that. But that specific qualification needs to be determined by a doctor to really get, uh, to really see as to whether you qualify to be given that drug, that drug. It's not a drug which you can just go and buy over the counter or just go in any clinic and just get it there. There must be, at the moment, the way how they brought it in is actually that you need to meet those conditions before you can actually be put on those drugs. Doctor, uh, can you tell us which one of these drugs uh, works better? Yeah, uh, the, uh, bo both of them are antiviral drugs and they can all be taken orally. So bo bo both of them have got their own places. But if one looks from the research and from the findings which have actually done during the time when they were doing the trials, the Pax Paxlovid have actually come out much more stronger because what it did, what it did is actually that when when they when they did a double uh, a double blinded randomized trials, they in placebo based they actually have actually the outcome of those studies have actually shown that they reduce progression from mild or moderate disease to severe disease, which will actually even infect resulting into hospitalization. They reduce hospitalization and complications and death by 89% compared to the molnupiravir, which is actually doing the same thing for the reduction of 50%. So if you look at the numbers, clearly pavoxylate is actually much more better than the, than the other one. 
But you know these drugs are there. And all those big countries are actually eyeing for that. Everyone is actually running for that. And at the moment, there is not much supply. Everyone wants to get it because you've seen, they've seen that it comes in. It actually, it's got, it's one of the few drugs which, which have actually come in with uh, mortality benefit and even morbidity benefit. So those many countries, many rich countries are actually eyeing for that. And they've already, before the drugs have even been produced, They've already put up orders because they can obviously give more money for, for those specific drugs. So it's going to take a bit of a while before we can even get it. But yes, there are mechanisms of actually trying to make sure that there is an equitable distribution worldwide. So I will actually go for the pavoxylid, which I will say might actually give us a better, better buy for our money. But both of them have got, have got their role and if what, especially if one looks at the side, side effect profile, for instance, I mean, what they can actually do. So that's the that's reason you might actually end up not qualifying to take this one because of the side effect or your response to that. And then you will have to have that other alternative. Speaking of the side effects, uh, Dr. Ismail. Um, what is this? What can you tell us about the safety, you know, of these drugs, and what are the side effects that may come with uh, taking these uh, antiviral pills? Yeah, that, that, that's that's actually the main reason why these drugs have got to go through trials when they are being developed. They take a group of uh, individuals who are actually exposed to these drugs, and they are being monitored regarding the side effects and obviously the efficacy of these drugs as well, but we're talking about now the side effects. What they have actually observed is actually that if I can take the, the side effects one by one, generally serious side effects are very rare. It's almost, there's no drug which you can actually say it's 100% safe. Even a simple drug such as Panato can actually cause serious life-threatening side effects. But be it as it is, we're all using Panados. We know how safe they are. And this is exactly more or less in the same type of category, which I will actually say. But the, if you look at the molunapiravin, for instance, it can actually cause dizziness, it can cause headache, it can cause diarrhea. And with, by causing diarrhea, it can actually result into certain medications not being absorbed properly, especially for those, for those individuals who have got to take a specific amount of medication. So in that situation, you need to be much more careful on that. So if a drug actually makes you DC or gives you a headache, you may have to know that it's also going to affect your driving, driving cars or bicycles, for instance. You will not want to do that after having taken that drug, especially if you're experiencing those type of side effects. For the, for the pavoxylate, the side effects which are mainly coming on that is actually that they can raise your blood pressure, they can also give you, they, they can also give you diarrhea, but they can also give you muscle aches, and they can give you a sensation of loss of taste. These are really the mere things. And then further on, if you look, if, if you look for the pavoxylate, you need to be very careful that it cannot harm your liver. I mean, there are liver liver problems or liver abnormalities which can, which have actually been noted, which can actually come as a result of that. And also for people with kidney problems, especially the ones which have got severe kidney disease, those ones should actually not even been given drugs, those drugs. But then, then the other additional side, side problem is actually that in the way how these drugs are working, they're working, I mean, if you look at the pavoxylate, it's actually a combination of two antivirals and a common antiviral, which we actually use in HIV, which is called retinovir, which is actually then being used to use the basic substance, which they call nematelevir. And that substance is actually, that, 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 the retinovir, which we also use, which is a protease inhibitor, which we use in HIV as well, is actually then being used to prevent the breakdown of this, uh, of this active substance, and that's allowing higher levels of this drug, and also these drugs to remain longer in the body. But that drug has got serious drug interactions. For instance, when you give it to someone who is actually being taken, I can just talk about anti-epileptic drugs or anti-coagulation anti drugs, which we use for clots in the body. This, this levels, the levels of these drugs can actually be changed. 
in either in a in, in a very undesired uh, way either that it suppresses those levels of those drugs to the extent that the drugs no longer prevent the epileptic attacks or that the drugs no longer work as an anticoagulant and then aggravating the same problems so these things need to be looked at Doctor, the other thing I wanted to ask, you mentioned earlier was that um, if you're older than 12, then you can take the Paxlovid, and if you're older than 18, you can then um, be administered with the Malnupiravir. You also mentioned the individuals who have certain health conditions who are eligible for these, um, these drugs. I wanted to ask, what are the other um, you know, requirements? So who else is eligible to be able to take these drugs? Yeah, the, the, those are really the main the main ones. I mean, we've looked at the age. Um, we've looked at the age, the two ages, as I say. That's one of the conditions. And then, obviously, we have also looked at the. We've also looked that you need to be symptomatic. You need to have signs of disease, which is severe, which can be mild, or or moderate. Meaning that if you are if you are if you are in hospital and you are severely sick, you've got seriously critical illness or whatever it is, and you require oxygen, then you are in a different category. Then you should actually not be taking, taking this drug unless you have started off with a, with a mild disease or moderate disease where you were not seriously ill and then you have progressed into a much more severe state. Then you can actually continue taking your five-day course of these drugs, okay, that is a situation, but it's not being used for people who are seriously ill in general. Okay, that's, so that is what one condition, and you can also not take these drugs if you don't have a proof that you have a, got a COVID infection, you cannot take it as a preventative, prophylactic type of thing. And you can also not, for instance, I mean, uh, very often people, you might actually have been exposed to someone who have been who have been COVID, and now all of a sudden you are fearing that you may actually on the longer run develop this this infection as well, and for that sake, in that situation you cannot use it as trying to prevent the onset of infection. You will have to wait for the infection to develop. You will have to have mild disease to moderate disease. Those are the main two things. And then the most important thing is, as I, as I said, this, they seem to be very strict on these three conditions. The three conditions, the conditions that you will have to have a, a pre-existing condition which will put you at risk of, prog of disease progression, ending up in hospital with the various complications of that. Unfortunately, they seem to be very strict. And in general, when I also looked at the way how they prescribe it, where they have been using it in, in the USA and also in England, they have they 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 only talk about two ways. You can either acquire it through a doctor who is looking at those three criteria which I've given you, or the other the other way how you can actually acquire it is you it, they they will look at you in terms of being enrolled into the feather studies and the feather trials. That's a way how you can put your hands on these drugs. Unfortunately, at the moment, at the beginning, because these are new drugs, the prescription or the indications for that are relatively rigid. So when they when these drugs comes into our country, we will most it will most probably not be very. It will not just be a simple thing of anyone just going for that. People have got to be screened and being looked for as to whether they fulfill those three conditions which I've actually been talking about. Doctor, what about pregnant women? We know that pregnant women are, I believe, higher risk of contracting uh, COVID-19 because their immune systems are compromised, obviously, when they're pregnant. Uh, are they eligible to take these, these drugs? Yeah, as, as you rightfully say, pregnant women are actually at a very high risk of disease progression when they develop COVID. And they are usually the ones who may actually end up in hospital and ending up with all the various complications of COVID. But the unfortunate thing is actually that they don't they they don't qualify to be put on these drugs at the moment. 
because it's this uh, just like the, you know you remember that at the beginning when we were using vaccines and the new other drugs we these vaccines were not available for pregnant women because the studies which they have actually done when they were conducting the trials testing the effectiveness of these drugs didn't include pregnant women so people were actually fearing the possible damage which it can actually be doing to the unborn child and for that reason these drugs were not allowed at the beginning but as time was actually getting on and as the experience was actually getting on like many other drugs they started allowing it but for the time being for both this for both these drugs they cannot be used in a pregnant woman and in fact it's even for the mole, uh, for the mole, for for both of them it is actually advised that the woman should be on appropriate uh, contraception methods whatever it is and also even to the extent of even making sure that those contraception me contraceptive methods of preventing pregnancy are being maintained for even four days after completion of the course of the treatment because of the fear of teratogenic i mean of of, of those of, of those teratogenic effects the damage which you can get on the baby and then maybe just a similar type of question it's also for the same reason that they can that they are that these drugs are also not allowed to be given to breastfeeding women because the manufacturers are not so sure what quantities of these drugs can actually go into the breast milk and affect the baby. Dr. Ismail, individuals that have underlying health conditions and um, especially ones with serious underlying health conditions um, are usually on medication. Um, how do we know that these drugs won't interfere with the medication uh, that they're currently on? And a lot of it could be chronic medication that they're currently taking. It's a very good question. Uh, the, 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 the main thing is actually that for, you know, we're talking about two drugs. If you look at the molupinavir, that seems to be relatively safe. There, there is no documented drug interactions or expected drug interactions yet, meaning that basically that the drug, the, if you have been given, just taking an example of, for instance, I mean, I've given you a previous example of someone being put on anti-epileptic medications. For instance, with, with a Molun Punavir, you don't have any problems. And indeed, that is the reason why this, both these drugs must actually be available, because you might find a group of individuals who are on certain drugs which actually prohibit the use of the one. But the, the tricky thing or the problem comes in with a Pafflovit, uh, Paflo, which is actually a drug which consists of two components. You, you have got the component which they call nimaclevir, which is actually the basic acting component, which is actually preventing the, the multiplication of the virus. That, that, is, that is the main component. And the other one is actually a protease inhibitor, which is called retinovir. And that pro the, prote the protease inhibitor is actually there just to make sure that the body doesn't metabolize this drug quickly. So it makes sure that the, that the levels of these drugs are maintained for a long time and the drug remains effective for a long time. But, and, and that itself comes through inhibiting a specific enzyme which is actually found, which is actually being used by many drugs as well and by many systems. They, they call it a cytochrome P450 or whatever it is. And that is where the problem comes. So what, what it does is also that it doesn't just, in, uh, doesn't just prevent the metabolism of this drug. It also starts interacting with other drugs. Once it's HIV medications, the retinovir, by the way, is actually a drug which, is, which we use in the group of antivirals with HIV as well. So the, when, 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 when someone, for instance, I mean, and that is where the problem is, when someone with epilepsy, for instance, starts taking it, there, there is a rapid break, breakdown of, of this specific drug as a result of these new drugs, and then the person starts getting epileptic attacks. We have also mentioned the issue with a drug called warfarin, which we use for clots, and you know that clots is a common problem in patients with covid and uh, when, when you take this specific drug, it might actually result in ineffectiveness of these drugs, and then the clots can actually become overwhelming and cause problems. But it can also be interacting with contraceptive pills, for instance. 
the patient might be actually be taking these pills and then the, the contraceptive pills are not working. Generally, when we're talking about contraceptive pills, you, when you've got COVID, obviously you should not be very close to people. Uh, you should actually prevent any contact as such per se, but should it actually happen, then your, 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 your type of uh, defense will not be there. But the one important thing is actually that, which I would actually like to, to, note, to note on that point, is also that since there is just one component of an antiretroviral, anti-HIV drug in that one pathologist, and you yourself, we, we know that when we are using anti-HIV drugs, they are combination of at least three drugs. So now, when you expose someone who has been known to be resistant to have, have been known to have a resistant HIV virus, or who has known to be to have failed on its treatment. If you just introduce this specific antiviral, uh, this situation might actually make it very difficult for this person to go on because it will also it it will actually aggravate or it will worsen the drug resistance against the HIV. So you should be also be very, very much aware about the HIV status of the person or the drugs which the person is doing as to whether this person is actually very effective. And that is, again, the reason why you need to have people who really got specialist knowledge or specific knowledge about these factors. You can see it's not drugs which can just be prescribed by anyone. The people who are prescribing these drugs needs to look at the, at the patient as such looking at what is he using, what is his specific conditions, and then having to take a decision as to can this person actually really use this drug or not. So that, that, that is the reason why it's there, but the drug injections are definitely a very important point to be aware of. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, just our participants this morning that are joining us uh, on Zoom, please, if you do have a question for Dr. Ismail, uh, you can either just raise your hand or you can put it in the chat box and, and interact with them and get a response to your question. Uh, continuing, uh, Doctor, is, are these uh, antiviral drugs uh, only um, you know, effective against the, the Omicron variant? Yeah, the... You, you, one, one needs to understand one thing, you know, if we're looking at the variants, how do they come on? So far, the variants come on as a result of pressure on these viruses. We know that we started off with the, with the original Wuhan strain, which came from China, and then it changed into different things. You know about the alpha, you know about the alpha strain, which was in Britain, you know about the beta strain, which was in South Africa, and then the delta, which actually caused a lot of dev devastation during July, June. We all went through that, and now we know about the Omicron as well. These are mutations. These are changes in the information in 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 the in in in, in the in the, the uh, in, in 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 the structure of the virus itself. These were changes, which are specific changes. And when you look at the virus itself, the virus have got its material, its genetic material, what the enzymes and all these things and the tools which it needs to, once it gets into the body of a cell or into the, in, into the cell where it can actually release that material and start using, manipulating the body and start uh, manipulating it, uh, the body in, in, in such a way that it can actually start multiplying and that but there is obviously also the shell of this of this virus and 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 which consists of a of a spike protein a specific type of thing which we call a spike protein now this spike protein is the one which actually attaches itself to the cells if we all if we look at all these variants all these variants have actually changed when 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 they came on they have actually changed the spike protein characteristic the attachment, the, the means with which, with which it actually attaches itself on the cell, these, uh, these are the ones which have actually brought a lot of difficulties and problems to our immune system and also to the drugs which we have actually brought on. Now, those mutations have only been on the spike protein, even with the Omicron, but all of them have actually been having those mutations mainly based on the spike protein pipe. Now, when, we, when you're looking at these oral antiviral 
they go much more deeper into the virus. They attack, they attack the, the, the specific enzymes, which we call the replication enzymes and proteases. And those enzymes are inside the cell. So they are attacking a mechanism which is completely different from the mechanisms which these variants are using to evade, to evade the treatment as such, and, or to evade the destructing mechanisms of the treatment. So there's actually no reason why one should actually think that these drugs are not going to be effective against any other variants which are actually coming, unless the variants are starting to change now and the mutations are affecting the, the enzyme systems inside the virus itself and no longer just being restricted to the spike protein or to the shell part. So yes, in fact, generally we actually expect these, these drugs to be much more effective. Uh, there are obviously ongoing studies in which they are also looking and evaluating and seeing as to indeed whether the, the, this, uh, whether they will be, whether Omicron or any variants can actually pose any challenges or, or not. Thank you, Doctor. We've got two hands up. Uh, Calvin, uh, you can go first. That's all right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ismail Kashitai. We do appreciate. And my name is Calvin. I am a journalist. I work for Eagle FM. Uh, I just want to find out, um, once we have these drugs right here in Namibia, or once uh, the global population begins to have access to this drug, uh, is it still relevant to continue chasing after uh, um, the quest for herd immunity, uh, understanding that we now have some sense of protection even for those that are infected. Uh, secondly, uh, what is the possibility of the availability of this drug actually driving and influencing vaccine apathy as people uh, begin to rather embrace the drug more than the vaccine? Already we know that there are people that are shunning the vaccine right now. And uh, once the drug is out here and it's proven to be preventing death, and we are saying that as much as the vaccine um, uh, does not stop you from getting infected, but it's, it, it reduces the chance of death, the drug is doing the same here. What is uh, the potential of this drug for t uh, driving a vaccine apathy, people rather opting the drug as opposed to the vaccine there? And uh, my last question is, once this drug is available, already you are saying that the chances of us getting this drug in the first round are quite slim because almost every other country is waiting for this or are waiting for these drugs. Um, uh, is there any way that we can, this particular round, prevent hoarding, understanding that in quite a number of countries, hoarding itself is an illegality? Is there any way that we can safeguard against hoarding this time around and to prevent what may potentially be a drug uh, uh, apartheid. Uh, to start off with the issue of herd immunity, I mean, we we looking, you you know our current stats. We are most probably somewhere there, twenty percent in terms of being having people who are being vaccinated, contrary to most of the most of the countries in the developed world, they're talking about 80%. It's, it's just a reverse ratio which we are having. Obviously, you, you, you know that the issue with COVID is actually life has got to get on. We cannot continue being in the same situation. But the unfortunate thing is actually with us is actually that our numbers, I mean, in terms of actually achieving herd immunity, our numbers are still very far. And people, as you yourself actually know, people are quite reluctant to get to, to get vaccinations for whatever factors which are around there, whether it's a, a, I, I won't think that it's a matter of people not really getting information. It's a matter of maybe fear or what other factors which are driven, driving people, be it as it is. That 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 is the situation. But the main, main, main most important thing is when we're looking at herd immunity and trying to get out of it, achieving it is maybe people at the moment are no longer talking about achieving herd immunity. People are talking about the damage and the consequences which this pandemic has actually brought upon, upon, up, up, upon our country, for instance. I mean, looking at the economy, if you're looking at 
the schools and many things which have actually come almost to a standstill. These are the things which one really want to try to prevent. And uh, if one try to face the reality, the reality is actually that we are dealing with a, with, 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 with a, with a pathogen which is very, very effective in actually evading whatever we are actually throwing to it. And it's actually a pathogen or uh, a, di a disease causing thing which has actually brought, which has come on our system and actually started overwhelming most of our resources, the instra infrastructure, the hospitals or whatever it is. Yes, we might have actually thought about the last, the fourth wave which we had with the Omicron, which many people actually thought that it was actually very, very, very mild because of the number of people, many people who were infected, but who didn't develop serious symptoms. But still, during that fourth wave, we still had a lot of people who end up, ended up in hospitals. And these are the vulnerable people. These are the people who actually, the diabetics. And you have actually, we have also noted that the elderly people have actually been severely hit. If you look at the numbers, the statistics, which are actually showing that a lot of geriatric people, especially from the north, have actually been passing away. If you look at, if we observe the period of December, if you observe the period of January, a lot of people have actually lost their lives. And the unfortunate thing is actually that these were actually the vulnerable people who actually on the longer run actually ended up losing their lives. So the primary aim, aim, aim of actually treating this COVID pandemic maybe as much as what we were actually targeting for herd immunity, the primary aim is actually to make sure that we don't have those overwhelming numbers of individuals falling sick and then progressing into a severe state where they will have to go to the hospitals, end up being put in the hospital, end up being put in ICUs, and then obviously also ending, ending up losing their lives you know, if you think about the time, the, 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 the recent time, if you look at around about five, six months back again, how many people have we actually left, uh, lost in this country? If you think about all the professionals and all the people who could have potentially contributed to the economy of this country, there is a lot of things which we have lost. And that is actually the primary aim on the longer run of actually doing, trying to target for, trying to make sure that we deal with this condition the issue of herd immunity will still be there. It's still relevant, but the main thing is actually, it's to try to protect these type of consequences of people falling in sick and then overwhelming our systems. We, you, you see, we're spending so much resources, the public sector, the, the public sector as well as the private sector, they're spending a lot of resources instead of actually spending those resources using it for, for instance, I mean, giving food to people, giving work to people, they are so much engaged trying to fight COVID to the extent that all those resources are now just withdrawn to fight COVID instead of actually using it for other things. And we all need to think about better ways of actually getting ourselves out of this year. We, it's not just the government alone, and that is on the longer run, the reason why we will have to think about better ways of working on that. And we don't have much options. We have got that, when, you, when, you, when you're looking at that, we need to look at examples of countries which have been in the same situation. When we look at, at the moment, clearly the whole world is definitely using the same type of methods. Whether you're looking at China, whether you're looking at uh, yeah, Russia or the Western world, they're all using the same world and they still believe in getting most of the people vaccinated and if you speak to epidemiologists and, disease, and people who have been studying diseases, they believe that once, once we have reached a big number of people being vaccinated, we will on the longer run actually end it, ending up protecting, protecting ourselves. So that con concept of herd immunity is there, but it's obviously there to try to get us out of this spot which we are. If, if, I look at the, if, if, if I look at the oral drugs which we are giving, you remember that I mentioned that these drugs are only, at the moment, only meant for specific people. It's not everyone who's going to get them. Even if you've got a mild, moderate disease, there's still conditions which you need to, you need to show a proof that 
your, that you have got COVID through the laboratory test, but you also need to show a proof that your, your, your condition is so much so bad that it warrants using these drugs because, because of your risk of progressing into severe disease. Yes, as, 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 as you actually rightfully said, the hoarding of, of these drugs, there, is, there are bodies, international bodies, such as WHO, UNICEF, and these bodies have actually gone into, into making agreements with the manufacturers, making sure that there is an equitable type of uh, distribution of these drugs. They have already gone and signed contracts with these, with these, with, with these manufacturers, which will actually compel the manufacturers to reserve a specific portion for the underdeveloped countries and making sure that those that these drugs are actually available. So it's actually quite difficult to look at that. And uh, I, I think that those are basically the things, you know, on the longer run, you know, people can, can look at that. It's difficult. We try, we try to educate people. We try to give them all the information. But if people decide not to use specific drugs, then it's obviously factors which they are actually using themselves. But obviously the, the, the consequences are actually that the unfortunate thing is actually that the, the drugs themselves don't really offer the solutions per se, which uh, they are not the replacement for the vaccines, if I can actually bring it that way. And that information must actually be ma made much more clearer to everyone. The vaccines will still be one of the ways of actually preventing us from getting COVID, preventing us from ending up in hospital and preventing us from losing lives. So it's just a message which everyone eventually have got to get. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we also have CJ Namene who has his hand up. Uh, CJ, you may pose your question. Hi, Nina, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Um, doctor, I just wanted to ask, or John, John Colin Amene is my name. I am from, I'm a journalist at the Namibian newspaper and Desert Radio. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, I mean, we spoke about the mutations and we saw that there are many factors um, that lead to uh, these variants mutating. Is there perhaps a fear within the scientific and, um, I guess, medical community that these drugs themselves might trigger a mutation to the virus? That's it. Thank you. Yeah, the, 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 main, the main thing is actually that, you know, uh, for the time being, what the information which we have got is we all know about that, that most of the mutations are actually almost all of them with the variants are actually affecting the spike protein. And we hope that generally this will be, this will actually remain the normal pattern. But I will not exclude the possibility that the drugs themselves, the virus become, could actually become much more smarter and much more clever. And in, in order to, 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 to evade destruction by medication, the, you might also start seeing mutations in the genes which are actually encoding for, the, for those specific uh, enzymes which are, which, which are replicating for, I mean, which, which are affecting the replication or the specific enzymes like the protease inhibitors. In fact, when you're looking at, for instance, I mean, conditions such as HIV, that is, in fact, these things have actually been seen. And even some anti, anti bacteria and viruses which have actually been affecting patients, bringing patients in the ICU, we've also seen that those bacteria, after being put under, under some type of pressure, they on the longer run, develop mechanisms of, de of, of evading the destruction and the killing from the drugs. So I cannot, I cannot tell you specifically whether this is actually going to happen or not. We hope it's not going to happen because for, for the time being so, so much what we have actually been seeing, we've been having COVID for close to two years. We've only seen the mutations on the spike protein. So we hope that this these mutations are not going to affect the effectiveness of these specific drugs. But the good thing is actually that there are still many drugs in the pipeline which are still in development, development phase. And it's almost just like looking at, for instance, the way how we treat HIV or the way how we treat, for instance, diseases such as TB, which have also been having a lot of 
mutations in the way uh, which, where, where these organisms have been mutations in order to evade the killing. Now, what we have actually, what the scientific community have actually been doing is they have been coming up with various combinations of drugs. When you're looking, for instance, at the way how we treat TB, we're using four drugs, at least four drugs combinations to treat this year. And we're looking at a combination of, uh, for instance, in Asia, a combination of antiretrovirals, which are also four, which are attacking the, the virus from different corners. So this is something which could potentially also come up in future, should we go into a situation where these mutations are now also evading these oral medications. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Calvin has another question, and then thereafter we will round uh, things off. Calvin, the floor is yours. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. I was saying, Nina, thank you for being so kind. And uh, Doctor, thank you so much for the articulation. My final question there being, uh, we have experienced, um, you know, stats providing antiretroviral drugs for free because of the seriousness of uh, HIV. And we have also seen stats making uh, vaccine access free because of the seriousness of the pandemic. Uh, are there any indications that when this drug comes, it's going to be free for the majority of Namibians or, or all Nam Namibians right here in the country? Are, are you getting those kinds of messages from the state, either here in Namibia or at a global scale? Is that conversation going? Uh, yes, uh, th thank you for that uh, question. I'm, 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 I'm one of the GPD chairs of the case management committee, especially the scientific pillar, which is actually tasked as to looking at various issues which are pertaining the way how we're going to fight this COVID pandemic. And one of the duties of that is actually to look at drugs. As drugs, as informations are coming, new informations are being revealed about a drug which has actually been used and with its side effects or with its, all its problems, whether there's a need to withdraw these drugs or indeed with a discovery of such drugs, for instance, that we, as soon as these drugs are actually availed, it's for us to look at the data and the evidence and then we, we, we take that evidence to uh, the Ministry of Health top management. We inform them that, that yes, there's these two drugs or there's this specific drug, and we feel it also needs to be used in our treatment guidelines. And then with that, we also interact with the, with the central medical stores or the division or the ministry, which is actually the pharmaceutical division, which is, which is tasked on acquiring these drugs. And in fact, I can only say that we have been, once we got this information, we've actually been talking to the, to, the, to, the share, to, to, to the director of this specific division. We are working on something where we can actually make a recommendation as soon as next week. As, as soon as next week, we want to make that recommendation. And then obviously this, these colleagues there in the directorate of pharmace uh, pharmaceutical service will then look at that information. For the time being, we have actually given a go ahead that it's definitely worthwhile that we need to get these drugs. And they're looking at ways of also getting it. I've mentioned to you that there are international bodies such as COVAX and uh, the World Health Organization, which has actually been tasked in setting up these agreements with uh, various manufacturers and making sure that these drugs are also availed to the to the, uh, to the developing countries. And this is the situation. So we're making sure that we also going to acquire this. And once we acquire this year, obviously just like the other drugs, we making sure that these drugs are also being made available for those who need it in the public sector as well. But obviously also those drugs will might also be available for those in the private sector. It will no longer be an issue of just that you have got money, you only on medical aid, and that's the only way how you can get it. If you end up in the public service, you should also be getting it. So we are in the process of actually acquiring these drugs and making sure that they are availed to those who don't have the means of actually getting them. Just like in the previous occasions when we're using drugs such as remdesivir, we were using drugs such as Actembra, we were using drugs such as steroids. These drugs were also available in the public sector and they were available for anyone who needed them. 
Dr. Ismail, thank you so much. Calvin, they say great minds think alike. That was my last question as well for Doctor this morning. Uh, before we say goodbye, Doctor, any final remarks uh, from you? Yeah, it's the, the 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 main thing is actually that I think these drugs are offering us another opportunity of tackling COVID. You know, we all we have all seen what COVID can actually do. We have gone through. I don't I don't want to think about the time in June, July, how bad it was for our country, how many people we have actually lost, and in fact, when we're talking about losing lives. Uh, this drug will actually give us or having or, or having our systems being overwhelmed, our hospitals being overcrowded, people having to use a lot of oxygen, very expensive tools. If we get these drugs, they will most probably, if we start using them very early during the time when someone is actually being infected, was showing very mild symptoms or moderate symptoms, if we use them very early, if a drug can actually prevent progression to severe disease where you require hospitalization by 89%. That is quite impressive for a drug like that. So it is, and, and the benefit is actually that where these drugs is, you, the treat, you can take that treatment actually at home. So as in particular for the groups, as, as you have actually noted with the Omicron, many people got infected, but they didn't require to be in hospital. But unfortunately, there was still the vulnerable group of individuals who ended up in hospital and they ended up in hospital, they ended up on ventilators and they, some of them, many of them, many of our loved, loved ones, especially our genetic population from the North, end up losing their lives as well. These people are, are parents of someone, doesn't matter how old they are, we still want to keep them as long as possible alive. So if these drugs can actually be brought into the country and offer us an opportunity to protect those individuals from ending up being severely sick, ending up losing their lives. This will actually be a very good breakthrough for our country. So with that, I think we will do all our best to try to get this drug into the country. Thank you for having had me here and listening to me. Thank, Thank you, you so much for taking time out to join us this morning, Dr. Also to you, Salma, thank you so much for your time. To all our participants, thank you once again. Uh, of course, this episode will be available on the NMT YouTube page, so you can watch it there once again just for uh, research purposes or to catch up on some points that you may have missed. From us, myself and the NMT team, it's goodbye. Thank you. Bye. The Ask the Experts platform is a monthly segment that offers an opportunity for Namibian journalists to engage noted experts in one-on-one -on -one discussions on the COVID-19 pandemic. Journalists get to pose questions to experts in various sectors to ensure that they are equipped with the necessary information to better inform their readers, listeners and viewers. COVID-19 is our common enemy. Together, we can defeat it. Proudly brought to you by the Namibia Media Trust and the DW Academy.